Welcome to Jazz Zone Together, our online jazz community where we will provide jazz education resources, interviews with jazz educators, artists, and celebrities, along with valuable tips and repertoire suggestions. Today, we are excited to welcome to Jazz Zone Together a truly talented jazz performer, trombonist, composer, arranger, band leader, and music educator, Wycliffe Gordon. Wycliffe's varied and highly successful career has taken him around the globe performing. Now, I'll turn the mic over to Dick Dunscombe to conduct the interview with Wycliffe. Dick, take it away. Thank you, Bob. Well, I've been waiting for this one. Wycliffe Gordon, one of the most famous jazz musicians in the planet today. This is going to be fun, and Wycliffe, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's our pleasure. You know, uh, we do this uh, on a regular basis to uh, introduce our, our viewers to jazz greats, jazz educators, and you fill both of those categories. So what we'd like to do is to begin the interview by having you share how you got into music. And what what led you to your pursuit of music and music education? Uh, that's, that's kind of a loaded question. Um, how I got into music? Well, um, I was introduced to music by my um, my father, or you know, me and my siblings, our father. Uh, he who studied and played classical piano. Um, so we'd always hear you know Beethoven or Mozart around the house particularly the Moonlight Sonata, every now and then Schumann, Schubert. He really loved classical um, piano, but um, the practical application of his, um, you know, work as a musician took place in the church. So from a very young age, we, you know, heard gospel music. We'd go to church with our father as he played for the choir, piano and the organ. And, you know, and that was the introduction Um to music for us, mainly piano music. And um, I think being in the first grade, the first time I heard a band, which was a jazz band or a stage band, uh, they played, it was really exciting. We heard marching bands, um, but upon hearing that jazz band, you know, they performed and then they gave an, a demonstration of each instrument, starting with the saxophone. I was like, wow, cool. Then, you know, trombone nice and then the trumpet my first time hearing that um live and in person i said oh that's the instrument that they say in church blew down the walls of jericho then the piano player played i said but i heard that all my life the bass the bassist played was an electric bassist and it was that doom, doom, i said oh man i like that but then when the drummer started playing it's like low high rhythm i was like oh wow i wanted to play drums Went home, immediately asked my parents, I want to play a drum set. <laughs> they were like, nope. <laughs> you know, first grade and then, um, but by the time I got turned uh, 13, well, actually 12, my brother Lucius, who's older than I, he went to junior high school. And during that time, you could take up to three electives. So you had to have PE. And then you could take a wood shop, automotive shop, home economics, band, chorus. He chose band. And of course, like all the other boys, he wanted to play trumpet or saxophone. But the band director suggested that he play trombone. So my parents got it for him. And he, um, I came home from school and I saw it lying in the case. So I've seen that before. So I want one. My brother's a year older than I. So in our household, Something was purchased for him. That could be a trombone, a dump truck, bubble gum, ice cream. <laughs> me being a younger brother, I had, I had to have it. I begged my parents until they got one for me. And then just shooting far ahead, that next year we're in uh, junior high school together and then on to high school together. And um, after my second year playing, I kind of fell in love with, you know, playing the trombone. So... By the time I got to high school, I went to try out for the whole county band, the district band, all state. And the biggest one, you know, the greatest experience for me during my high school years was actually being in the McDonald's All-American High School Band. 
where they select two students from each state. So it was great. I was playing with the best high school players that auditioned for that band that year. And it was, I, I just, it just kept me going. Um, and, you know, and before that, um, I didn't know much about jazz, but I heard jazz on a recording. I had a great aunt that passed and of the things bequeathed to our family with a five record, a record player and a five record collection set of jazz. This is called the Anthology of Jazz. I think it was Columbia or Sony, I forget who put it out, but it had everything from the early slave chants on through the modern jazz of that time, which included like Count Basie's big band and or Sonny Rollins, like Bebop, had Ragtime, they had this. Well, I fell in love with the music from New Orleans, and particularly that of Louis Armstrong, but there were other bands, like I said, it was a compilation, but that was my introduction to um, jazz, and you know, again, just um, skipping, I, I would listen to it all the time, but skipping ahead, I played throughout high school, and of course went to college to be a music major, and that was where, in my sophomore year, I got a chance to meet um, Wynton Marsalis. And, um, you know, and I, I met him, and a year later, he called, you know, see how I was doing. And, and during the summer, and uh, you know, make a long story short, I eventually got invited to come out and play with this band. The first time at the Caravan of Dreams in Fort Worth, Texas, I was completely unprepared to hear musicians play at that level. Um, I was cool playing in 4-4 four, four, and 3-4, but they were doing some other things. You know, my age, Winston was six years older than I, but Todd Williams, who was in the band, was the same age as, uh, you know, as I and then the other guys, you know, we were, we were close together. I was like, oh, wow. If I could have, if Fort Worth, Texas were maybe, I don't know, five, ten miles from Tallahassee, Florida, I'd have walked out and gone back. I, was like, I wasn't ready for it. But little did I know that was the thing. And by the end of that week, information I'd gotten from Marsalis and Marcus Roberts and other guys in the band. You know, listen to this. Check this out. He gave me a list. And I began to buy music and really um, check it out and, you know, got into it. Later on, I was invited to play on a gig with the band um, at in Washington, D.C. at Blues Alley. He was working on the Christmas, the holiday CD, Crescent City Christmas card. And I'd, I'd gotten my playing um, together a little better and got invited to play on that CD. Um, and that was March, February, March of 1989. Went to say, what are you doing for the summer? I said, well, my scholarship doesn't cover summer school. Normally I go home and work make money for books. He said, do you want to come out and play? I said, yeah, sure. I called him on my birthday, May 29th, uh, 1989. And he said, call my manager. My man, I called his manager. And then I met them at the Spoleto Festival in Charleston, June 6, 1989. And that kind of began my career with the band. It was just a temporary, temporary summer thing. And, um, but I was not, um, so happy with school and he invited me I think four or five days after he said do you want to stay out and play for a while and I thought about it for all of 10 seconds I said yes I knew this was what I wanted to do and that began my career in jazz wow that's some story path Wonderful. Thanks. So uh, let's talk a little bit about some of the um, groups that you've created and led, including your own septet. Tell us about some of those highlights. Well, my group, I've worked with, I, worked with, I was the seventh member to join uh, a Wenton's band and it became the septet. I think it should just be called Wenton Marsalis or the Wenton Marsalis group when he had a, the quintet with Branford and then it became... You know, Todd Williams, Reginald Hill, Herman Riley, and Marcus Roberts be became his uh, new band, and that was the quintet. Then Wes Anderson kind of joined. It was a sextet. Then when I got the invitation 
and accept it, then it became the septet. So I had to learn. He had to prepare music just for a new group. Um, but when I I played with, went to from 1989 to 95 with the septet, then he disbanded the septet, did the Lincoln Center Jazz Orchestra, and um, I stayed with them until the summer of 2000. And then I knew I uh, took a teaching job, but I wanted to form my own group. So I've written for septet, but my group mainly is a quintet. Um, and it will start out as like Wycliffe Gordon Quartet. And then I said, you know, I want to have another horn. And then it was quintet, but I, I was teaching school full time. So I wasn't trying to be on the road full time, but I didn't want to have a group or, you know, a brand. And then we finally came up with the Wycliffe Gordon and the International All-Stars, which is a quintet, piano, bass, drums. And then, you know, uh, saxophone is clarinet, it's flautist, you know, woodwind person. I play brass and play woodwinds, and that would become my main group and has been um, for several years. But, you know, the music that I've written um, from quartet, duo, septet, big band, I've even written for um, orchestra um, arrangements and compositions. And, um, And a lot of my work has been with big bands, and that was born out of you know, being a clinician and going places to play with bands and they have their uh, Sammy Nestico charts and, you know, all the standard big band charts. And I said, wow. Um, and once I really started doing it, I would, I did an arrangement of George Gershwin's, um, not, well, uh, I did do, I got rhythm, but I did fascinating rhythm. And then I began to learn a lot about the business, which was, um, print publishing and that kind of thing. I just put it on the, I said, yeah, I want to play Nesco and all of that, but maybe I want to play some of my arrangements. And then I found out, yeah, you have to have uh, permission to sell, uh, to copy. You have to have permission to even write and um, compose or to do an arrangement. And once I found that out, I said, you know, I'll just start beginning to arrange some of my own compositions and let anything else that I arrange um it'll be part of a commission. So they'll take that on. But um, most of my work has been with um, performing. When it's with my group, it's a quintet, but I do a lot of guessing and, um, and I've performed with uh, big bands. That's been the bulk of my work. Of course, I love performing with the orchestra um, as a soloist, but mainly with the international all-stars. So, um, you know, I've done a writing for some, um, silent movies, and that would encompass the big band. But uh, so it's been you know that's been writing for choir, um, and not necessarily jazz choir. I don't, I don't, I, I love many different types of music, and I love the challenge of trying to get inside of uh, you know, those sounds, whether it's for SATB choir, chorale style, or even writing for a gospel choir, but um. I'm, I'm in my office at school right now. If I was at my home where I was intending to do this interview, you'll see behind me um, a wall of music that I've written, either composed, mostly arranged over the years. And I said, wow, you know what? When you are on the road 250, 300 days a year, it's kind of hard to keep up with everything that's going on. But then when you slow down, <laughs> it's like, oh, and I did all of uh, this, and some of it's good. <laughs> <laughs> hey, listen, man, I'm used to it. It is all good. And, and, and they, you know, we have a lot of jazz educators that watch these interviews. I know mm-hmm. I want to ask a question for them. How can they get a hold of this music that you've written? My website, Um, You know, you have to... It's important to understand in this uh, business, even as educators, it's a business. Um, you know, I'm, I'm employed by Augusta University now. I taught at Michigan State. My first teaching job, I taught seven years at Juilliard and seven years at the Manhattan School. Then I did artist in residence here in 2018. I started um, full time. But you're part of a machine and things that are in place. You have faculty and administration. But when you're doing your own business, and this is something I try to encourage um, my students um, to do, 
all the time. If you're a composer, join ASCAP, BMI, CSAC, or, you know, be rewarded for your work and your intellectual um, property. So, um, you know, as an educator, I feel like we have to educate ourselves, not just about um What's in the classroom? Let's say a particular class. Our classroom is very um, wide, so it would behoove us, I think, to learn about the music business, about publishing, about mechanicals and that kind of thing. So being a recording artist, but also a um, an educator, I want to share all of that information with um, my students. Say, so, hey, you can be a lot more you can have a lot more say in the outcome of your musical output. If you just, you know, you're in, you're in music, you're composing, take advantage of this. ASCAP rewards their composers. And I didn't, I didn't know that. Even when I joined a friend of mine shared with me, he said, Hey, Jay Lenhart. He said, um, say, have you thought about doing the ASCAP plus award? I'm like, I don't know. What's that? I said, they reward you for writing. You know, and if you're an artist that's, um, you don't have to be rich and famous, but if you are, you, you're recording CDs, you're working in places where your music can be heard and played, you can get rewarded for that. Now, of course, that's done by committee, I believe, but he said, yeah, I get a check in January and I just, I write songs. And that's what we, I said, wow, why not I benefit from that? I said, thanks for telling me that, Jay and I try to pass that on to my students, but oftentimes we just worry about music. The music is just, just right there in front of us. Well, how did that music get there and how far reaching is it? So you know, whenever I go somewhere, I'm always willing to play the music that they um, that they may have in their library. But I, I, I also want to add my music to the library. And uh, so it shouldn't just be Alfred or G. Shermer or the major publishing houses because I've done arrangements for them as well. And you kind of get a dime, maybe 15 cents on a dollar if you're lucky. <laughs> but when you do it yourself, you, it's a little more of an investment, but you're, 100 and, you're probably 100% invested in yourself and the return is um, great. So... I know our producer, Bob, is uh, smiling at this moment because he's also a publisher. Oh, great. <laughs> and this is such great advice that you're sharing with us. Let's, let's turn a little bit different direction. And you've performed with most of the big names uh, in the jazz world today. Mm -hmm. Share with us some of your most memorable experiences. Well, I mean, that's an easy question. Um, I when, when I was on the road full-time, my greatest, um, I got a chance to meet a lot of performers. You know, I met Miles Davis. I didn't perform with him, but I got a chance to meet him. You know, I met Dizzy Gillespie, but I got a chance. To, I did perform with quite a um, few. Oh, wow. Benny Golson. I, I mean, I'd have to go through the list, but the one that's most um, poignant to me is the years I spent with the Wynton Marsalis Septet. And, and, and I share that because, you know, I, I was with that group for a while. And when you're playing with someone at that level for that amount of time, you build a relationship and a bond musically and socially that's just, um, you know, when you're young, you're not really thinking about it, but we're a little older now, and it's like, wow. And I, I think back on the years, I can see an itinerary, or I can see a photo, or I can see some video footage from something we did back in the 80s. I was like, oh, wow, man, I, I, remember, I remember that. Like a gig, I remember we were playing a soccer stadium in South America, um, it was an Amnesty International concert. And we have had many memorable concerts, but one, one that I particularly remember about this, we were playing a blues, Duke Ellington, and we started, you know, soloing. And then the crowd started singing this chant. It was in the soccer um, stadium. There were 
20,000 people inside and another 10,000 out. And I think, was, you know, he, Sinead O'Connor was on that, like I said, it was an Amnesty International concert, but they started singing with us. Da, 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 do I don't know the words. Da, 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 da. But it fit over the blues. And I was like, I was playing, I said, oh, wow. Little catchy tune. And I was like, and the feeling of having the, that whole stadium plus the people that were outside. I was like, man, you know, the concert itself was good. But, you know, in that moment for that three or four minutes that that chant kept going, I, you know, it it was um I was like a great feeling to then be in communication and in touch with all those those folks. But and that happened with that group. And there's something else that would happen that I would share with um students with the group. It doesn't happen all the time. Two fifty, three hundred days a year on the road. We play and every now and then, you know, everybody sounds great. Sometimes it, we the cats will walk off stage and say, Oh man. Forgive me for how I sounded tonight. Now I know what that means. You went for something, you probably didn't quite get it. And it's like, oh, I, I was right on the edge. And I was like, but everyone else was saying, what are you talking about? You sounded great. Because a bad night for Winton is still a great night for most. I mean, yeah, what is a bad night? A bad night for Wes Anderson, a bad night for Todd Williams. I, you know, it's like, or, you know, Hurling Riley on drums, yeah, that was bad. So, but then there's those nights when it's like, man, they're on fire. Now, when you play with somebody as much as we played together, it's um, you know, what the norm is. But the thing that we used to do that I never forget: everybody took pride in the way they dressed. Now, you can only bring so many suits on the road, but you can bring a lot of ties. <laughs> and uh, that's one thing that we did in the band is just like, oh man, I love that tie. Like mm -hmm. so, every, you know, everywhere we go. And but we wanted the image to match the, the the level of music that we were trying to put out. So the point is, when that happened with one person, like man, Wes, man, you 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 were on fire tonight. It's like just you know, went to yeah. You know, like I said, every night a bad night. You know, what's a bad night? The thing that's most point, uh, poignant about that band is when it would happen with the whole band. And as much as we're on the road, it would happen once, maybe twice a year. Most of the time it's not recorded. Everything that you've ever worked on and could try with the band, if we're, we're, we're playing something and uh, Herlin goes a third above the time, Bill a third above the time, uh, and, and it comes back together, and that's just musical science who's really listening for that but we all we all feel it and um, the audience feels that and we get on a bus at the end of the night not just that one thing happening but it's like the band is playing at a level so high that it's like our feet are not touching the ground I mean it literally feels that way and we would get on a bus to head to the next city and we would just say hey man um, it happened again and nine times out of ten is, is never those nights weren't recorded it was just like everything that we, you know we talk about and that's the other thing I liked about that band we always talked about the music after the gig yeah did we talk about uh, current events yeah but we always talked about the music I'll never forget I'll never forget that. But the, that feeling is something I was like, man, that exists. I want to get back to that level of musical camaraderie and relationship and share that with other people. Because when, when, you, when, when, when you're playing music at that level and everyone feels that, you know, th there, there's nothing like it. I guess I can just call it spiritual. But it happened with the Wet Marshallis Septet. And um, it, it, it hadn't happened much afterwards, but I try to tell, tell folks, students of music, um, that if we can, we can get along like that on the bandstand, and then if we can get along like that in the world, I, I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not going, I'm not going to go on my rant about that. But I think that the world can take um, what it is that we do as a band, the success of a band. You, I, you know, I mean, it doesn't matter who's soloing. 
not in that band because the best part of the solo, a lot of times is what's happening around the solo. And for me, it's like, ah, I'm, I, I'm in it. You know, when I first started playing, I'm like, everybody can only hear my solo. And that band is like, no, it's a collective improvisation. And what is going to happen, uh, you know, to make the musical situation better or to just, you know, raise it up. And sometimes when, when we get off the band, I say, hey, man, forgive me for how I sounded. I didn't get the chord change that Eric Reed threw at me or the rhythm that hurt I said, but show, 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 can you show that to me? And then the next night, it's just, it, it was just always like this. So um, with that man and uh, that, I'll never forget. So out of all the people that I played with, you know, meeting Dizzy Gillespie, meeting um, Lionel Hampton, playing with him. It was a great experience. But that most, um, the experience at that level, that's an easy question to answer. It happened with the Went Marcella Septet. And, you know, he disbanded the band in 1995. And somewhere after 2000, I forget the year, we were all in, a, in at Jazz at Lincoln Center where they have the Rose Hall, the big building, the Appel Room, which was called, yeah, the Allen Room years ago, and Dizzy's. All seven of us were in that building on three different stages, <laughs> and uh, including you know, including Marcus Robbins, who's in the who's in the band just for under a year when I'd come in because he started doing his um, Marcus Roberts trio thing. So let's go to Winton's house, and let's talk about even if it's just two weeks or a month to two of the original septet because everyone had moved in different directions you know folks got married and and um you know it was hard to stay out there on the road but um and we talked say hey, look i'll change my schedule you know it, it it hasn't happened but um there is we did something in philadelphia went and got a mary mary lou williams award i believe and they called us together and I, I pushed back a date going to Austria to be there because, you know, Marcus called so you know, Wycliffe, they called me Cone, but you're the only one that's not, not there. I'm like, okay, um, I'll do it. So when we all got in the same room, we are all older, but, you know, we looked at each other, cats kind of looked the same and, and all of those feelings from those years of making music it was just um you know good to be in the presence and even though everyone's gone on with their own lives we we, we we still have those memories so i'm sorry for talking about that for so long but that was a really good 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 question and i like to share that with people <laughs> you are such a great communicator mm-hmm. and i know that you've been reaching out not only on trombone but beyond that but what is this thing about the didgeridoo? The didgeridoo. Well, um, in high in high school, uh, I'm, I was that I was that curious kid, and during my free time, I didn't mess around at lunch. I go to the band room and play different instruments. Now, the didgeridoo wasn't one of them, but I was with Winton. I joined the band in 1989. And in January of 2000, we went to Australia. My first time, um, and you know, we'd been out of the country, but my first time going on that continent. And I heard someone playing a didgeridoo, and I was like, wow. And um, someone let me try to play it. Now, the placement of the, I've seen people do it differently. My mouthpiece, I want to be center. <laughs> I, want, I want to be center when I'm playing, but the didgeridoo people kind of play off to the side to get the buzz. And when I first tried it, it was very, I said, man, I, I don't know how they're making that sound. <laughs> but then I picked up my trombone and began to figure out a way to imitate that sound. I'm going to get up for a second and just grab it. So, um, I was messing around one day and and began to make that sound. Another thing. That, another That's thing. That, it, man. 
<laughs> Another thing they would do is like, you know, circular breathing. I knew how to circular breathe. So I kind of got design in my head. And because this is made of metal and a didgeridoo is made of wood, it's not exactly the same sound, but it kind of simulates the sound. And we went back to Australia and New Zealand that next year. And um, I don't have it here in my office, but um, um, gentleman, Australian gentleman had made a didgeridoo out of PVC pipe and he had an original didgeridoo that he made. And this time I just kind of turned a little bit to the left, I mean, to, you know, to the right. And I got the buzz sound because the opening is a little bigger than it is on a trombone or tuba. He said, oh, wow, that's, that, that's, that, that's great. That's great. And they would make sound. <laughs> Barking animal sounds or <laughs> something like <laughs> kind of sounds a little bit uh, reminiscent of the uh, tube and throat singers, but again, it's much higher. And uh, so that guy gave me that didgeridoo. He gave me that one that he made, put it in the case. I said, really? And I still have it to this day. And I was just like, oh, wow, another instrument to make music on. You know, as I said earlier, leave me in the band room with instruments. I'm like, how does that work? <laughs> how does that work? And um, so that was um, very interesting uh, for me to learn to do that, then to learn about the history of the instrument, the indigenous people, the Aborigines, and how they um, created the instrument, how they're made, um, you know, the ant or the insect that would eat the bark from the center, and then, you know, they cut it down and showed me. But they talked about how they made them, but I was really interested and the sound and what I felt when I heard it. Because when you hear them play, and sometimes they're just on the street, just um, seated in a squatted position, you know, and then they're playing, I was like, man, this, it's it's something, I don't know, something guttural. But, um, he, you know, uh, and I thank my high school band director, Mr. Butler, um, for that. I think in a, in a way, his name was Hartness Butler, he would say, he tell me all the time when I'm trying out for something, you can do it, Cliff. You can do it, Cliff. You know, solo and ensemble competition. So you can do it, Cliff. So I think in, in, in a strange way, he gave me permission to think that I can do anything. So if somebody said, you can't do anything, you, know, you can't do that on trombone. You can't do what? So for that reason, I don't allow my students, young or old, to tell me what they can't do. When you tell yourself you can't do something, that simply, that simply, you know, defeats the 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 reason for even trying to do it. So I would just, I would just, you know, try to do it. Um, try it out, like I said, all county, ten, all district, all state, right? And then the McDonald's band, I was like, and that was eye opening for me because I was the saddest trombone player in the band. They had twelve, <laughs> nine. Nine um, tenor trombones and three bass trombones. I was trombone number. I was uh, tenor trombone number nine. Everybody played better than me. <laughs> I was like, and I ate it up. And then they had the McDonald's All American Jazz Band, and that was. I mean, it was. It was so many opportunities to see what could happen in music and what what that meant when you you know you you bring people together and. Um, to make music and what it what it what it actually does, and I just have to remind students now um, that it goes far beyond the stage. You know your licks, your ability to play a good concert, and I share with them. A student here at my university um, told me um, when 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 someone gives me a compliment in the audience, um, I, I kind of take it with a grain of salt. I rather hear from a we hear from a musician or someone to study. I said, well, let me encourage you to consider changing that way of thinking. People have come to our concerts from work, uh, and if it's on the weekend, a work week. And if we, if you played music that made them feel good, I mean, you know, when you get sick, you go to the doctor, or you need something done with your teeth, you go to a dentist, you go see a specialist. We musicians, we're specialists. And um, even though people don't have to make an appointment, they have to buy a ticket or come to the concert for free. But when you play something for someone, 
and they told you that they they really enjoyed your class to never take that lightly <laughs> that that this is what we we're kind of like doctors in that uh respect music heals people and so it's never just what's happening on the stage we're projecting um you know, you, you, we're projecting that on on folks. And besides, if musicians are good and they're working, they're not going to be at your gigs. So, so they're not going to tell you. If people don't like what you play, they're not going to tell you. So anytime someone play, pays you a compliment, I'm like, I say, I never take it for granted because that could have been a very, um, you know, life life changing moment, even if it's just for that night. So you can just say thank you. And if that's what you really feel, keep it to yourself. <laughs> Wycliffe, you are such a beautiful person. I'm so thrilled to have this opportunity to share time with you. I've got enough questions to last for another hour, but we've got to close it out. And uh, here's, here's my uh, second to last question for you. Mm -hmm. What's on the horizon for you? For me, um, well, you know, COVID hit and just sh um, shook things up a bit, knocked the bottom out. And it was um, me, I, I kind of like being home after you know, COVID. Everything started shutting down in February of, no, matter of fact, March, flights, March of 2020. They started talking about COVID. We heard about it when I was on the cruise ship in January. It's like, yeah, some virus. It's coming to the United States. I'm like, what are they talking about? Matter of fact, talk started probably back in November. But in either case, by March, let's see, March, three or four months in, I looked at my calendar and saw that, wow, that's a lot of gigs that uh, have canceled and have been postponed. And I would get an interview, then Zoom and Teams and all that stuff took off, like what we're doing right now. And people say, well, I bet you can't wait to get back on the road. And I said, I bet you I can. <laughs> I had been threatening. I said, man, I'm not going to travel this much, but the opportunities will come. Um, during COVID, I learned to love being home. Um, I still travel. I still love to write, compose. And even though a lot of those things slowed down for me, but, you know, being 55 now, uh, years young, old, however you want to look at it, um, for me, on what's on the horizon is you know, continue to work with my um, students here and in your hometown, which I'm sure you know. You both have probably the most difficult job because you know you're well, you know you're, you're you're here. You know you've been teaching, you've been running bands, dealing with professionals and students alike. Um, so on the horizon for me is just, just just to continue to share things like what we've been sharing today and to try to inspire students to reach for, you know, you, you have to work um, at it, but we play music and the, the reward, um, the end result is not the reward. It's, it's, it's the, uh, it's that preparation. It's the journey. Like one of my favorite sports heroes, Muhammad Ali said, you know, it's the fight night. That's not the glory thing. He said, it's all the work that you, you know, dancing under the lights. That's the night of the fight. That what prepares you for that is the work that you put in before you, you know, before you get there, the fight night, before you get to the stage. And, and um, that's the best part of it because that's where your growth and development takes place. And I try to tell students all the time, that's, you know, what's the hardest thing about practicing? And they say, well, this, working on this. I know, no, it's just started. Nothing's hard about practice. What's the hardest thing about music? Well, it, it, these songs are hard. I said, nothing about music is hard. When you break it down, it's pretty simple. And um, so for me, I want to continue to just um, share those things. And I still travel every now and then. One-nighters, don't want to do that anymore. But, you know, two or three days, I'm happy to um, come out and uh, work with students or not even work with, you know, just share with them. Because a lot of, oftentimes, I learn a lot because um, I, I listen to what the students' uh, concerns are. And um, But, you know, if they're asking me about, how can I develop this, my range? How can I develop that? I start to answer them and then I stop. I say, wait a minute. Um, how often do you practice? Well, um, first thing, 
<laughs> not all of them. If they don't say I practice six days a week for three hours, they say, well, um, and then they look off. I say, here it comes. About, um, it, about, um, I said, okay, that's the answer to your question. I can't tell you what to practice, but until you create a practice, you, you have to be willing to, um, you know, work on this. But the most fun part about that is when you see that you're actually responsible for your own development, not your music teacher, and that you can control how um, you have more control over how good you are that you become. You have a hundred percent control over that. It's like it'll either motivate you or not, but it's not difficult. So that you know, that's kind of what I want to do and. Uh, to continue um, to do, I want to continue playing, um, writing, and composing, but I don't need to be on the road um, anymore full time, traveling 300 days a year. Um, I love that, but I like being at home, riding my motorcycle every now and then, and, um, you know, just uh, sharing, kind of like I, I've done with you, gentlemen. Well, we can't wait for the next time that we're able to be with you. It's It's been such a pleasure. And, you know, when Bob and I conceived this uh, project in the beginning, we wanted it to be uh, exactly what this one has been, which is sharing uh, your philosophy, sharing your heart, sharing your music, sharing a pathway for people to go down to to achieve what you've achieved. And mm -hmm. this is just, this has just been very special. Mm. Well, 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 thanks a lot. I think that, um, and, and this will be the last thing that I say. Uh, I think that music um, succeeds where sometimes uh, words um, fail. Sometimes you can just reach someone with music, you know, whether it has lyrics or not. I've seen it happen with Louis Armstrong, also with myself. Um, and I didn't think about it until 15, 20 years after being on the road with Wenton. When I first joined the band, we went to Germany and I thought that we were there three or four days and the folks in the hotel that we stayed in, around the hotel, and the businesses, they looked at me like and if looks could kill, I wouldn't be here. And I thought it was because my skin was brown, you know, growing up in the United States, but it's because I was American. So everywhere we, we went on that tour, my first tour in Europe, you know, France, Italy, Spain, you know, Germany, I was like, oh, why, why, do, why do people stare at us? And I mean, but with, a, with like a look of disdain. And uh, Germany stuck out because we were there three or four days and uh, it was in 1989 when the wall stood between East and West Berlin. I went to Checkpoint Charlie. I was like, man, this is crazy. The history of people and how they treat each other. And I was like, wow. I go back to the hotel and, you know, same thing. But then we had our concert that third, the last night there. And uh, we were playing in the square. So the people that worked at the hotel and the business, they came out to the concert. And those same people that looked at uh, me like they wish I was dead, or at least that's how I read that. They were now, and I took pride in memorizing my music, so I didn't have to look down and stand all the time. I could look and I could see their faces. Some were singing, um, some were dancing. They were all smiling. And I was like, but in that moment, I didn't think about it. And I was teaching a master class 12, 15 years later, and it, it, it came to me. Um, I said, wow, the, the music turned their frowns to smiles. They were dancing. The same people they said, oh, wow, man. Now I think about Louis Armstrong in 1956-57 doing Black and Blue for two nations in uh, West Africa and Ghana who were just weeks before at war. And they called the troops now. They're, sitting, they're killing each other now. They're sitting side by side listening to Louis Armstrong and his all stars play a concert. And I was like, oh man, wow. And I would just tell people now, I said, there, there's a power and pathos in this music, or in music in general, that um, um, allows us to come in contact with our common 
humanity, no matter where we're from, no matter what we look like. And I often say, I say, you know, when we're having a war, maybe they can get a big boom box. For those of us that are old enough to know what that is, just drop it and let the music play. And I probably, I guarantee people may be probably put their guns down because, you know, I wrote a song about Louis Armstrong that says he stopped wars with his music. And so that, that moment for me was very poignant. And I said, man, I got a chance to see that. And then later on that year, of course, um, they, before the end of 1989, they tore the wall down the strip between East and West, West Berlin because there were fa- the same people on either side of the wall. Just one side had freedom and the other one didn't. And this, it was just really um, eye-opening to me. And that's been a one, one of the great things about music education, you know, the education in the classroom, but the education and just dealing with people. And that's how um, I think we live and that we grow and um, I'll, I'll continue to share those stories. That, that That's what's on the horizon for me. Music can sometimes relay what we have trouble with, um, you know, with what music can sometimes relay what words can't. And that the last thing I'm gonna say, I'm gonna, and I'm gonna get off the phone because now I'm talking too much. I, 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 language. We were in South America, played a concert, big concert hall, and the folks took us to dinner afterwards in this restaurant. They had a band setting up across the room, and we, you know, we kind of waved to the guys. We always have a translator, but we couldn't speak the language. We ordered our food. The band set up and started playing. And this was what went to the set. Tap. They started playing music that we had recorded less than a month um, ago that was released, and they were playing it from memory, and we were like, what? All of us got it from the table and went over to see, <laughs> went to see those guys, and we just said hello, and we just hugged them. It's just like, you know, I love you. We couldn't, we couldn't speak the language. They didn't speak English, and we didn't speak Spanish or Portuguese. Um but it was just like a, sh- a showing of love that was unforgettable. So anyway, um, you know, that's what I'm doing. Th- 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 those are my memories. And when you're in them, you know, you're in it. And when you're away from it for a little while, you see how it, had, it has an effect and impacted your life. And um, so that's what I want to share with people that are musicians or not, because I think we're all in the band and the world. If we can get the world to work like a band, man, this place will really be cooking. <laughs> so Absolutely. Anyway. Absolutely. Hey, listen, man, we can't let you get away yet. Could you play something for us? Yeah, sure. sure. Thank, thank you all for having me. And uh, I look forward to um, uh, this was a great conversation for me. Yeah, you all, but you all stirred up some good memories. Good. Mike Lift, thank you so much. Uh, this has been an, an incredible eye opener for, for us and it will be for our audience. To our viewers, thanks for watching. We hope you gained some valuable insights from the interview. Please 
few other interviews in the series to learn more about the interviewees and their contributions to music education and the world of music.